This is Cosmaston Medieval Village, one of the most popular heritage sites in South Wales. Situated just south of Penarth, it was reconstructed based on archaeological evidence in the late 20th century. It offers a chance for the community to experience medieval life and enhance their knowledge of the past. It is also a site of great archaeological importance, as there is still much to be learned. Cosmaston was founded in the 12th century by the Anglo-Norman family, the Constantines, who held power over the village up until the 14th century. It was a sub-manor of Sully, thus placing it under the control of the de Sully family which lived there. After the 14th century, the de Spencer family took control, but by the 15th and 16th centuries, Cosmaston had ceased to be a manorial centre and was turned into a large farm. This was due to the fact that in this period, we start to have less significant laws. During the Black Death, the village shrunk, but it never disappeared, surviving into the 18th century. The village was under the parish of Lavenon and possessed no church, which explains why no human remains have ever been found. Okay, the settlement at Cosmaston seems to have been founded around about the end of the 11th century or beginning of the 12th century um, after the uh, conquest of this area by the Normans and the establishment of a manorial centre here. Uh, in many respects Cosmaston is an important site for us because it represents what we know was going on very widely in England and Wales in the high medieval period, that is the period after the Norman conquest but before the disasters of the 14th century, famine, climatic deterioration and above all the Black Death uh, which wiped out at least half of the population and caused a really dramatic change in the way people lived and the entirety of the economy. But what we don't want to think about Cosmaston is that it is just typical of what happens absolutely everywhere else. Of course every site will have its own individual history but in particular here in South East Wales we think things really were rather different from the situation over the large area of England which has taken as being definitive of what the changes were in the, between the High Middle Ages and the Late Middle Ages. Cosmaston has also been the location of numerous archaeological excavations throughout the years, and the reconstructed village itself is based on the original foundations discovered by GGAT, the Glamorgan Gwent Archaeological Trust, when they conducted a series of excavations in the 1970s and 80s. More recently, 
Cardiff University has attempted to further our understanding of Cosmoston, thanks to a series of digs starting in 2008 and continuing every year since then. When we first started digging in this field, which was in 2009, we were aware that GGAT, the Glamorgan Gwent Archaeological Trust, had dug here before us. We had at that time only sketch plans of where they had dug, so we knew the shape and approximate location of their trenches, but not exactly where they were. So first of all, we set up two long, narrow trial trenches in this field. The very long one that I'm standing in now is some 45 metres long and just two metres wide, um, and another one that crossed it into T-shape at the edge of the field over there. Um, we simply wanted to find out how extensive the archaeological remains were in the field, how deep and how complex they were, um, expecting there not to be quite so much as there actually is. There's archaeological remains almost everywhere we look in this particular field. Um, what we've now found out, because we've been able to see where GGAT um, dug, is we've come down into their trenches, we can identify them again. They had a very large area over there in the area we're digging just at the moment. We've now got exactly the edges of their trenches. We can see how deep they went and we can tie in exactly um, their plans which do survive for us uh, with our own map of the field. Uh, last year, 2010 Cosmeston, we dug for the interior of the, of the medieval manor house. This year we're obviously looking at the outside and the extent of the walls, what, what kind of walls we could find. Last year we found walls that, which uh, reached two metres wide, so obviously lying across them, and it, most, most, normal people, most of the students could easily fit inside the walls. Uh, it showed the size of the manor house and how, how big it was. Uh, it's useful to show the size of it, uh, how obviously a large manor house in this area with the, med with the medieval village shows that it's going to be a significant building and a large, large influence over the people around the area. The location chosen for this year's excavation is at the far end of the field next to the reconstructed village in a 12 metre by 13 metre area thought to be the exterior of the previously excavated manorial hall. Okay, so this year we're digging outside of the manor house um, a little bit further north, we're looking at a series of features which were first identified in the trial trench in 2009, but this year we want to expand and to see what's happening to the north, to follow up a bit more on what we saw back in 2009. So far, we've had a series of walls um, which appear to be coming together to form several structures, um, at least one of which is circular in plan, it seems to be medieval in date, uh, associated with 13th, 14th century pottery, which could possibly be a dovecot type structure or a bakehouse, we're yet to see. Uh, we've also had a series of uh, linear walls, which appear to be linking together, and also which seem to be linking in with post pads, which may be something to do with a part stone, part timber structure, um, again associated with the manor house. Finds wise, we've been largely having medieval pottery, some later medieval, and on the very top we had uh, post med finds, clay pipes, blue and white pottery, you generally expect. Um, small finds wise, iron nails, a few pieces of copper alloy, but what has been quite interesting has been a small um, iron arrowhead, probably 13th, 14th century, which has come from a layer associated with the possible dovecot or bakehouse. Um, basically cleaning um, the shovel here because when we're taking a soil sample we don't want to get the soils mixed together for when they go in the bags. So it'll give us a false um, idea of what soil we're Alright, um, I'm cleaning back a wall at the moment, um, all over the north and south and this is a corner coming back um, west coast and I'm cleaning it back so we can like, get a better picture of what's going on in front. We're changing our contacts to um, get down the greeny clay layer. Yeah. Well, what I've been doing is basically I've been holding the measuring stuff which is used for the uh, dumping machine. The dumping machine is a manual way of holding the pipes, uh, therefore allowing us to know the thickness of the contents on site. After three weeks of careful digging and recording, most loose ends seem to join up and finally it is possible to distinguish some of the wall features present at the site, 
with a main north-south wall extending in the centre and other walls leading from it to the west, joining up with the second north-south wall. There also seems to be a trace of a third north-south wall on the east side, which seems to be interrupted by a later cut in the red clay layer surrounding it. The shape of these walls, and the clay deposits found within them, suggest that these were living areas. Evidence points to the fact that there would have been a first smaller room which was later expanded. This change may explain the presence of a drain next to the central wall, which would not be compatible with an interior area. In the northeast corner, there is also a circular wall, partially excavated by GGAT in the 1980s, which at the time was thought to be the base of a tower, but is now considered either a dovecot, due to the size and the bird remains found within, or a bakehouse, which would explain the red clay layer surrounding it, a sign that burning has taken place. Most of the walls are in good condition, but some of them have been robbed out at various times in order to construct new buildings, a feature known as a robber cut. As for finds, the site has been more than generous. In the first week, excavation of the northeast area revealed fragments of an aquamaniel, a pot shaped like an animal, in this case a ram. Dating from the late 13th or early 14th century, it is the second to be found in Wales. Aquamaniels were used at special events for guests to wash their hands. Also, inside the central wall, a coin dating between 1585 and 1635 was found. Originally minted in Nuremberg, this jeton was probably used as a pendant, as suggested by the small hole drilled into it. The fact that a German coin has been found in Cosmiston is important as it suggests some sort of connection with Germany, possibly trade. Other finds include French Saint Ange pottery, which is associated with the Gascony wine trade, an arrowhead close to the circular wall, and a worked bone, possibly in the shape of a spoon. How, what do we do in the finds then? Basically, once the finds have come up from site, um, they are all in trays and we get people to wash the finds and once those finds are all washed and sorted into pottery, bone, shell and metal and once they're dried we uh, bag them up and put them into their separate boxes, again bone and pottery and so they're all archived and ready to go off to the specialists. Um, Specialists generally don't particularly like to get material mixed up because bone specialists have nothing to do with pot and vice versa. So we try and keep things as ordered as possible because we don't want to uh, make our specialists unhappy. Um, we have had a range of material this year which has been brilliant, uh, very different from last year. We didn't have as much material last year. This year we have post-medieval pottery as well as medieval pottery. Uh, we have a lot of Bristol wares, which is particularly interesting because this is very different to the material we're getting from down in the 80s, from where the 80s excavations happened. We're also getting, we are getting some local wares, and the Aquamaniel was, well, is a local ware, and that's particularly interesting because we weren't really aware of how advanced the local pottery technology was, and this this shows us that we have good potters working in the region. Whether they're local or from Bristol or from elsewhere is another question, but it's been made locally, which is good. We also have uh, French wares coming up, and we've had quite a few French vessels, which is very exciting. Um, about 50% of one French vessel in particular. We have found uh, saint ware before, but not in the same quantity or quality, I don't think. As well as exposing the outer area of the manorial complex, another aim of this year's excavation is to conduct a topographical survey of the field next to the village in order to create an image of the site that may give us a better understanding of the archaeology which lies beneath the surface. So here we are at Cosmeston, and um, we're coming towards the end of the dig now, but uh, I just wanted to talk to you about what we've doing, been doing with regards to um, surveying. Uh, we're using uh, Topcon EDM, 
um, to do our survey and we've been undertaking a landscape survey of the area around here. Um, in what we're going to do, we've taken points across the field and we use this. This is the staff and the EDM takes distance measurements and height measurements from the staff. Um, we can then plot those into software and then through that we can produce um, a digital terrain model or a digital elevation model of the field um, which we can then use to look at the uh, topography and potential archaeology that may underlie the soils. Um, we also use this in order to what we call 3D in finds, so we can position finds within the trench in uh, three dimensions, Eastings, Northings and the Z value being the height. And we also use this to um, make plans of the trench. We can take areas uh, such as previous trenches where we found the uh, GGAT trench. Um, we were able to plot that accurately so that we can add those onto plans. Um, and we also use what's called a dumpy level, which is a, an old style theodolite. Um, also works well, not as complicated a piece of kit as this and you have to use tapes to measure your eastings and northings but it's a very good piece of kit when the battery runs out on the top comp, which it often does. And so ends our archaeological journey. The excavation has given us an insight into medieval life at Cosmaston, but more remains to be found. Hopefully interest in the site will continue, especially amongst the community. Um, I, talking to the man down here, he's showing me all about the while they're finding out and how long it had taken them and uh, the different parts, the different yes, ages then yeah. that they found it that very interesting. Very interesting, very informative, uh, the, uh, the young people who do the reenactment, um, the archaeological side. Um, it's quite interesting to see what, what they have uh, found. Um, Yesterday they found a coin. Um, there's lots of bones, lots of shells, pottery. I'd, I'd expected it to be more fenced off, and I hadn't expected to actually be able to talk to people actually involved in doing this. Favorite part, I think, is just the freedom just to wander and in and out of the buildings, and, and just get a good feel for what they're.